This is a Stock Trading Reality Podcast, episode 22. You want to get in the best price, and sometimes getting in at the lower price is not always better. It's better to have really the charts set up. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. And this is your host, who thoroughly enjoys conversations revolving around economics. Play Trader! Now, if you listened to last week's podcast, you're thinking, well, that's kind of a, a weird place for the fun fact, because last week, you know, you actually talked to an economist. Yeah, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and um, throw IT Nate, as we call him around here, under the bus. I don't know why he, he put things where he did, but in all good fun, uh, we were giving him a hard time about that. But yes, I do absolutely love uh, economics. I believe that, uh, and if you listened to last week's podcast, you've heard me say this, but I truly believe economics can summarize any situation. And I'm talking about relationships. You know, if, you know, supply and demand, you know, if somebody has a, a high demand of anger, you know, the, the other person can, has a couple of choices. They can just back down or they can raise their supply of whatever needs to happen in order to uh, overcome that situation. So, and I just totally made that up. I, Ches, does that make sense at all? Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I completely agree with you that it kind of it spills into so much more than, you know, just what people traditionally think about economics and, you know, um, you know, country's GDP or something like that. So yeah, I totally agree. Right, and I love this example too because I think my favorite economic principle outside of opportunity cost is the the law of diminishing return. And I mean, so let's let's put ourselves in this situation. You have that dozen, you know, Krispy Kreme donuts. You take that first bite. How good is that first bite, Chaz? Uh, I can't even put it into words, so I don't even. It's just it's fantastic, it's, right? It's the you've been looking forward to it for so long that yes, it's just awesome. Exactly. And then let's say you eat two dozen of these things. How good or how fantastic is that final bite of Donut 24? You want it to be as good as the first bite, but it's not. After two dozen donuts, you're probably thinking, I don't want donuts for you know another couple months. <laughs> yeah. And, and, okay. And that can, why is that the case? Well, because economics explains that the law of diminishing returns. The more something you do, or in this case, the more of the same thing that you're going to eat, you get a diminished pleasure return from that. So uh, but this is not an economics podcast, so we'll just leave it at that. But yes, I absolutely love economics. I minored in it uh, in school, um, and it's just, I don't know, I think it's very fascinating. And if you did not listen to uh, last week's uh, podcast episode where we talked to somebody, uh, Steve, who has a PhD in economics, so he's you know literally an economist, uh, you know definitely uh, give that a listen because that was a fantastic episode. But this week, we are talking with one of the original 300, uh, and I'll explain more about that in the actual podcast. But uh, John is with us. He goes by ESVA, ESVA, as uh, at least I per call him in the, in the chat room. Uh, and he's been around uh, since the beginning. Uh, and it was a great interview. Uh, it was nice to talk to a, a Southerner again. We've been on kind of a, a little streak of, uh, let's see, we talked to, uh, Steve was out in New Mexico. And before that, we talked to somebody from Nor Norway. So we've been kind of all over the, the map and globe now. But we're, we're heading back south again to talk with John. And it was a, a very good interview. He's got uh, we were talking afterwards. I think probably one of the, the, the my favorite quotes uh, in all the podcasts so far because it does a good such a good job of explaining you know how risk actually works within the market and uh, it just uh, it was it almost brought a tear to my eye. Ches actually was crying when he said the quote. I looked at him on the webcam and he had a bag of tissues. Uh, Kelly Trader, his fiance, was just wiping the tears away for him. So it was it was a very emotional moment for us. So uh, let's buckle in and let's get to this interview. Well, to provide a little bit of context here, it is a Saturday morning, uh, 8 a.m. Eastern time for our esteemed co-host, Chez, out in Southern California. He's up at 5 a.m. his time on a Saturday uh, to do this interview. So that if that's not dedication, I don't know what is. And John's also up very early in the morning, still 8 a.m. on a Saturday. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for uh, for joining on joining us on this fine Saturday morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, I just want to say this is a very humbling experience. But I'm looking, hopefully, through my uh, trading experience, my ups and downs, I can you know help other traders and uh, new traders that will that want to uh, trade. Yeah, that's fantastic. I like that attitude a lot. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe. You are one of the original 300, and for the listeners out there, what are the original 300s? Well, when I first got this site off the ground, 
I had no idea if it was going to work. I, I, just, let, I let, Let's give it a try. Let's just see if anybody's willing to, you know, join, join a community, you know. And you were one of the first people that signed up. Did, when you purchased, you got the lifetime membership. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, Clay. I think I was uh, one of the first ones. And through some email, uh, you and I corresponded. Um, yeah, I believe um, maybe it was last uh, 2014 of January, maybe, or February. I forgot when you actually started. Yeah, it was, I think, Dece- late December of 13. So, yeah, if you would have gotten in January of 14, then that would have uh, still put you within that window when I was – because uh, the first 300 people, after 300, I'm like, okay, wow, this is actually, I, I was kind of shocked it's actually working. So I need to restructure it from a business uh, you know, perspective a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I, I, so John has been around for a long time. Also, Hooch from episode two, uh, he has been around. He's one of the original 300 too. So out of all the interviews we've had so far, uh, this is only our second person that we've uh, talked to, one of the original 300. So um, you know, I'm not saying that uh, not everybody is there, but that kind of shows, you know, trading, uh, you know, when you don't take things serious, you know, you're not going to be around for a while. So that's why I'm uh, super excited to talk to John because he, he's, he's been around and he's been around for, you know, the, the course of time. And, uh, you know, as you're going to find out, he's doing things the right way. So, John, let's start at the very beginning. You know, what, what, what got you interested in the market? And uh, we'll kind of go from there. OK, well, actually, it, it was a, a long ago, thinking back. Um, my father, um, went to visit a, a relative of his, um, she was an old maid and eventually, you know, once in a while I'll go with him and eventually she would start talking about stocks and here this lady was, you know, she, she was probably in her eighties and she had the nice, you know, the big blue chips, you know, uh, at that time that still around uh, AT&T, um, Exxon, uh, International Harvester. I don't even. I don't even know if that's still around or not. Uh, um, the, the big name stocks, and, and you know, she really started talking about investing and everything. And then after that, you know, it just, you know, I said, oh, that's you know, make money, this and that. And then after that, it was while wow, I guess I was maybe twelve years old then, and then it didn't start kicking back in until maybe my early 20s uh, when I got interested and I can remember I think calling a broker I, I knew a guy uh, in this area who was a broker and I said I wanted to start investing in some star time I was in the Coast Guard and uh, I had some money that I wanted to start with and so he told me it was a new pharmaceutical company uh, named Glaxo and it was selling for maybe, I think, $10 a share or something like that. So I purchased a few shares, and I made a, a few bucks on it and everything. And then, you know, the early 20s, you really don't think about in, investing or trading that much. You, you get away from it because you're young and you're um, just doing different things. So, um, actually, I didn't even... I just started moving on with my life, and uh, till about maybe seven years ago, seven to eight years ago, I guess it's been, and um, I thought about stocks for some reason again, and I started uh, Googling it, and um, I went Uh-oh. to a Google. Pod- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I went to a, um, it was a web page uh, with stocks and symbols and everything, and one of the ads on there was a chat room. And I think maybe Clay or you might remember there was uh, or Chez uh, stock hideout. I think maybe that was maybe possibly the first one, and I went to it. Yep, and, I remember. I remember stock hideout. Real quick, just because I'm curious, okay. um, and I don't expect you to. You know, if you want to give your age, that's totally fine. If not, I, I, I respect that. But okay. you said you called your broker to right. place a trade. Now, for uh, at, at this point in time. Wait, brokers actually have phones? Uh, don't you just? I thought everything was online. So, uh, you know, what year was this when you had to call your broker in order to, to place a trade? That was probably. Let me say. I would say, uh, maybe seventy nine, eighty. Okay, that's awesome. Like that. So yeah. you're you're straight up old school, man. Like I yeah. 
to most people listening, to myself included, uh, I, I mean, I was born in 83. So I, you know, to me, it's like, wow, that, that's just called picking up the phone and having to actually interact with somebody to, to place an order. And uh, was so, I just, again, out of curiosity, was this, he said he mentioned uh, a new company. So was this broker giving you like a hard sales pitch to buy or were they just kind of, you know, walk me through, how did, how did that work? Like were brokers just tell me what to do or are they trying to, you know, get you to, to buy stuff? No, actually I knew him and he, he knew uh, me. And he said that uh, this is could probably be a very good company in the long haul. So I went ahead, like I said, I purchased a, a few hundred shares. And, um, and then I started uh, at that time. Um, it seems like every day I would always check the symbol, you know, and say, okay, what's the stock doing? What's the stock doing? And uh, I just got interested, interested a little more and more each time. And uh, eventually I, I sold it. Uh, I made a little bit of profit on it. And, but looking back, I wish I'd held it. <laughs> <laughs> HindsightTrader.com. There right. you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, I'm the CEO of HindsightTrader.com. So uh, be sure to check out my services. But, um, okay. But uh, so so yeah, of course you know once you got that money on the line, it was it was kind of exciting at that at that point, wasn't it? Yes, it was very exciting. So now that you kind of found this interest in kind of stocks, now um, you know I I know you know you're not obviously actively trading at this point. You're, you know you're just getting your interest peaked. Um, did you decide to do some more kind of you know I guess they they were considered IPOs back then, or you did you start looking at kind of some more blue chip stocks at the time? No, that was the only one. There was one stock. It was a low price stock, and I think it was, uh, if I remember right, it was trading about three dollars a share. Uh, Mesa, I think it was a Mesa Petroleum, and uh, I bought a few um, hundred shares of that. But that never did move, so I pretty much broke even on that. And as far as the blue chips, I really didn't go into. And this is probably over maybe a year, a year and a half span for as my interest with the, the stocks at that time. And then after that, I just pretty much, you know, my life started changing and I put it aside and everything. I, you know, I went into Coast Guard. I was in the service with the Coast Guard five years and everything just started changing. And I didn't worry about so much investing or the stock market at that time. And and then you said you came to the stock hideout site, which uh, was a message board. Like if if I remember right, stock hideout. That is correct. And, and that was that's pretty much all penny stocks on that site. If I'm thinking of the same thing, right? Was that mainly penny stocks? Yeah, yes, it was. It was one of those uh, buy the penny stocks, and you can get rich overnight. Okay, and um, so did you did you drink that Kool Aid? Were you believing all that hype? And you know, where where did you kind of where did your journey go after you arrived at stockhideout.com? So take us from there. <laughs> Okay, well, once I, I stayed there for a while, not too much longer, of course, they have, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I just went ahead and, uh, and I didn't put a lot of money into it because um, I'm very conservative. I've always been like that with my money. And it was one of the guys I can remember. Uh, I asked him, I said, well, what's a good stock to buy? Uh oh! Asking yeah. a person, <laughs> asking a random stranger <laughs> on a message board, what's a good stock to buy? There, if yeah. you find your... It's a good learning point here for John for everybody. If you find yourself doing that, don't do that. That's a huge sign that you need to take a step back because uh, uh, remember they they were total strangers to you. So I thank you so much for admitting you were doing that, John. Because I think That's a lot right, of people yeah. have uh, a problem admitting that they do that or used to do that. So thank you very much. That's I love You're the welcome. transparency there. Yeah, and I, I did ask him, and he said this is good stock, and so I bought it, and. Um, of course, uh, it started going up, and I said, oh, I'm starting to make money. Of course, it was a, a pump and dump now, looking back. And, of course, it, one day it was up, the next day it was uh, just dropped. And I said, something's not right here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, eventually, I did not stay with them too long after that. And um, then I started moving, you know, just finding other places, you know, maybe other chat rooms and um, – I guess I find another chat room, and I did learn a lot, and I find some some traders that really taught, started to teach different things in there, and I think that was the turnaround right there. 
uh, about the pump and dumps that he, they told me, you know, you, you, just, you need to start learning. You can't trust anyone just because they say you need to buy this. You need to do your homework and everything. So th- that was the turning point, I believe, in my uh, trading. I'm uh, I'm actually quite stunned, though, that some strangers on the Internet actually did kind of give you some good advice in the sense that, you know, you would be better off helping yourself by, you know, learning how to do this stuff versus, you know, following any one particular person. Um, but, yeah, like kind of Clay said and kind of what you mentioned, too, that, you know, we we catch a lot of people who are just looking, you know, they want somebody to either confirm their idea or, you know, if they're in a bad trade, they want someone to say that, oh, it's totally okay. And that's totally a natural human thing um, to look for some affirmation in your choices. But, um, but yeah, that's actually, you know, that was actually pretty nice of those guys. Clay, you probably, you'd agree to have some strangers actually tell you, you know, you'd be better off learning. Um, yeah. Most people nowadays, and I don't know if that's a generational thing, um, they just want, you know, you know, throw hot picks at me. Text me this hot pick. Do you have a Do you have an iPhone app or something? And right. I think it's a changed uh, quite a bit. No, well, actually, I, was I'm this sorry, a penny stock chat, chat room that you were getting? These guys were being good with you. Uh yes, it was. Uh, that that is that's shock. That's prop props to them. That's uh, very good to hear that because usually penny. I mean, whoo. I mean, just filled with sharks after sharks. So, uh, well, that's that's very cool that these guys actually were straight up with you and said, "Hey, man." Uh, do your homework. Now, homework, hopefully they weren't saying to go and What was their definition of do your homework? They didn't tell you to go start researching PE ratios, did they? No, but actually, uh, it, it was a uh, pretty good chat room because they actually, uh, like once a week, they had education. They, they, they started teaching about the indicators and, you know, the charts and everything. So I was really surprised. So that's, that's, Again, you know, that's when I actually started learning about, you know, the indicators and the moving averages and everything. This is blowing my mind right now because I don't think, uh, I don't think helpful, <laughs> like Clay said, I think, I think they're more so filled with sharks now, at least from everything I saw. So, so yeah, that's, that's, and obviously, you know, to me, learning technical analysis was like learning how to, you know, read the story of a stock. And um, it definitely, you know, piqued my interest considering that this is what I do now as a career. Um, but, um, but how did it go after you kind of did your, your initial, initial research Were you just kind of reading up books on, on various, uh, you know, uh, moving averages and indicators in general, or were you just kind of, you know, going off the advice of some other folks who were trying to kind of help explain it? Well, actually, uh, when they were teaching it in the, the chat room, like once a week, and then I'd go on, um, the internet and I would follow, you know, um, behind them just to see what they were talking about so it's not like i was as much taking their advice and saying okay i believe what you said i did fi- do a follow-up and they were teaching me uh, what other places you know were saying at that time on the internet so you got your confirmation that okay these people aren't That's just correct. making this stuff up that not is correct that. that makes sense so i mean at this time uh, I'm trying to think. This sounds like it was probably the early 2000s. Uh, that is correct. Okay, so did had you transitioned now to actually having an online broker? I probably didn't start till maybe it was maybe the middle uh, of the maybe 2004, 2005 is when I actually started. Okay, That's so when I actually put some money in, opened a brokerage account and everything. Who'd you open your brokerage account with? Out of just curiosity, from somebody from old school, oh, I have to pick boy. up the phone. Now you can do all this online. Who'd you Who'd you choose? Oh gosh, did mm. Talking Baby exist then? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know if e- was E Trade around. I don't know. I don't think E Trade. I'm going to say it was um, maybe like, Scott Trade. I think uh, that. Yeah, they were. They were always. It seems like they've been around for for. Yeah, yeah. Say, uh, there's a couple Scott couple Trade. big ones. Yeah, that have been around for a while. Okay, so 2005, you signed up for Scott Trade. You funded the the account. Uh, you know, and what what happened? Would you remember what the first stock you bought with uh, that Scott Trade account was, and how'd that go? Um, I don't really bl- remember what the actual first stock was that I did buy. Well, how'd uh, it go? How'd it go in it, general then? Just from that point, did I, you have it all figured out? Were you a millionaire from that point forward? Oh yeah, I had a million where I didn't have to trade anymore. I'm just throwing this throwing money away. No, actually, I, I can remember I did make some money on it. Uh, you know, even if it was just twenty dollars, you know, I said, "Hey, I made twenty dollars," and that started, you know, getting my interest right then. 
that money can be, you know, could be made. So John, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm sure this was a pretty cool experience coming from the, you know, the, the generation of, hey, I have to pick up a phone to place a trade. Now all of a sudden you're, you're clicking buttons on a computer screen and you just made $20. So was that, was that just a, almost like a mind blowing experience for you? It was, it was very mind blowing. And, um, I thought, you know, it, this is easy. You know, at that time, it, you know, you just get, it's like a momentum started going. And I said, you know, this is fun, but I want to really be serious because trading, you can have fun, but you really do have to treat it as so-called, and I agree, like others have called it, like a business because it, it's working, you know, it's dealing with your money. And I don't believe anybody wants to just throw their money out of the door because it's, you know, especially when you're working, it's hard earned money. I, I would hope that nobody just would enjoy, uh, besides Ches when he's flying his helicopter and just throwing money out, out the window, <laughs> I mean, besides him, but... Uh, lately, you know, he, lately, it's all the, the money I'm throwing away on buying these little dinky drones from China, but that's a whole uh -oh. other story. Yeah, Chez is trying to support the Chinese economy right now, oh. which, which uh, oh. yeah, at the time of this podcast is totally collapsing. But um, so, OK, so you, you, you're, you're, getting, you're having some success. Um, you know, when, when exactly did you, you know, kind of arrive to, uh, you know, Clay Trader and, you know, when did, you know, how did that kind of all transpire? Well, I'd always, Clay, I, I, I've been on iHub in, in at least five years anyway. And when you go there, you can see like the top followers and everything. And I always saw this name, Clay Trader. And I, and I kept all these followers. I said, you know, what is he doing? So I went ahead and uh, clicked uh, on Clay Trader's name. And, you know, I saw these videos and everything. Thing, and um, I started looking at them and and then eventually you know going back and forth and then it came up to the point uh, right before I joined doing some research and about Clay Trader and how good trader he was and you know he was he's a teacher and I thought hey you know this is this is getting good here i said you know here he's a teacher and he's teaching about trading i think i need to go ahead and follow right here so that's that's what i did i went ahead and that's when you were starting your service and everything and i just decided i i'm gonna go ahead and you know join your service and everything so my question is okay so you You've, you know, this isn't like you're just getting started in the market. You've been around. You've already yes. had some education, and you've had some people teaching you. So why, you know, why did you think you still needed to learn? I mean, oh, he's a teacher. I, I he's teach how to trade. You know, what? Just out of curiosity, I mean, why? What made you still want to, you know, try to, to to learn to learn at that point? I mean, so you did you think you had it all figured out, or you just like to learn? Or I mean, explain that dynamic. No, well, I've always. You, you can always learn more. I mean, once you stop learning, I mean, I, I believe in education. Um, I mean, I gra graduated just from high school. I don't have a college education, but uh, I think I've been very blessed because I've continued to educate myself, you know, from taking just courses um, online. And uh, e education, it, it's just, I mean, you can't you can't put a price on education and I'm always one of those. I want to continue to learn whether it's trading or, or whatever, you know, dealing with my job because it's just go better yourself and your finance. I love hearing that. Um, so, no, so not only is it, you know, weird for me, I've never been in an environment where I ever, when I was trading specifically, I actually had to call somebody up and, you know, wait for, you know, 30 second confirmation or anything. So it's cool to kind of hear about that stuff. But, um, but yeah, from the education side, you know, it really just does pay dividends, and I don't think a lot of people appreciate that. Um, and you know, I always try and tell people, you know, while you, it, especially you know, if you're gonna pay for something, it will pay for itself in the long run um, if you let it, if you actually kind of take it to heart. But I don't think a lot of people realize that. So that's you know, I think it's pretty awesome of you to kind of recognize that you know, you always are are trying to to you know, better yourself and further yourself and. Like I mentioned all the time, guys, the only thing that I believe is a constant in, in stock trading is that the market is uh, is uncertain. You never know what's going to happen the next day, so that's you correct. Kind of stay on your toes. That's so, the only uh, thing that is a guaranteed in the market. The only thing is that is certain in the market is uncertainty. So good point there, Chaz. 
So, um, so from there, you know, so now you kind of, you know, you, you found Clay. Um, he looks like, you know, he knows what he's doing. He's been doing it for uh, quite a few years at this point. Um, and you kind of go through the courses. Um, now, are you immediately richer? Are, are you, you become a, a millionaire at this point? No. Um, Wait, I'm what? Not... You signed up for my service and you didn't become a millionaire? Just stop. Uh, what are you, podcast what are you... over. Podcast. Yeah, pod- yeah. What are you doing? Come yeah. on. <laughs> no. Um, but, you know, when I signed up for it and I started uh, learning from, from day one uh, on his teachings, my, it's the education has been just great because uh, I thought I knew a lot more before I went before I came to Clay. But to be honest with you, and, and Clay and everyone else, it, it's unbelievable on how much my eyes has, has opened up to trading and feel, feeling uh, more disciplined and more confident in myself that I don't have to rely on other traders for a pick like I used to. So isn't it just a, a, a great feeling, I, I mean like a sense of freedom of just being able to find a stock to totally trade on yourself and like you said, not have to rely on somebody else for a stock pick? Uh, yeah, you know, it's going back uh, into the, at the beginning in the penny stock chat room, uh, you know, what stock do I need to buy? Uh, those days are over with. Um, I can rely on myself for as, you know, my education on what to look for through the scans and through the indicators, uh, moving averages, lines, and, and so on. And it is. It's a, it's a great feeling that I don't have to rely on anyone else anymore. Yeah. And now I, I remember, you know, way back when, when you were first getting started, uh, you liked those stocks that were – I don't know. I don't think you ever went over five dollars, if I remember right. But you liked definitely. You were just playing those sub ten dollars stocks, and uh, you uh, that went pretty well for you, if I remember right. You were kind of just focused on uh, that price range, wasn't it? That is correct. Yeah. Usually it would be um, the one to five dollar area, the, the small caps, and um, what I would always look for is on the charts is the um, the oversold area and once it would start coming out over sold the i call them the bottom plays that that's where i did pretty good on uh, and, and that's what i like you know right now still but i'm still looking at other areas especially especially recently uh i've gone to other areas uh, besides bottom plays uh and and see how i can do with uh with that also now, what do you think would be kind of an average holding time um, for when for when you're trading kind of these bottom bottom fishing plays that you had going? Uh, probably uh, up to seven days because when I once I would get in and once I would get in a little bit too early because you know you want to get in the best price and sometimes getting in at the lower price is not always better. It's better to have really the charts set up. And pay a few cents more, then you, you don't have to hold your money so long. But usually it would take, once the stock would start moving, I would usually hold it for maybe about three or four days. Uh, oh, I, I might start crying over here. That was such a good quote. Not Buying at a lower price is not necessarily the best entry point. That, that That's so, oh, mind-blowing quote right there. Exactly. Some people are saying, what are you talking about? You want to get in the lowest possible price. But what John understands is it may be a lower price, but at that point in time, the risk probably doesn't match up with the re- potential reward at that point in time. That Whereas is if correct. You let the, yeah. If you let the setup take place a little bit more, sure, price-wise, you're not getting in as low as you could have. But the risk versus reward has all shifted. And you know, that may not make sense if you're newer out there or whatever, but you know, that's just, you know, as traders, that's what we have to be focused on. Well, how does the risk pertain to this situation right now? So, John. That's going to be definitely the quote we play before the podcast. That was okay. so good. Uh, you know, I, you, just because you might get in at a lower price, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's chess. I mean, is that does that 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 just summarizes what we're trying to teach around here, right? Risk versus reward. That's exactly what we teach, and the reason we do that is because we're we're firm believers that you know no one no one can predict the future, but the one thing we can do 
um, is kind of is you know minimize our risk as best we can, and that's the only way to really you know have long term success in this. And you know, John, John's not uh, you know not new to the market by any means. Um, you know, John, did you ever actually have any kind of blowout losses or any kind of huge losses at all? Yeah, um, I think that was at the beginning of not when I first started, but when I started getting in uh, far as trading, and this is probably maybe four years ago, five years ago, um, it was like, you know, I'm a, I'm in love with the stock. It will come back. It's going to come oh, back. Fell in it's love going to come back. Yeah. Uh, never love a stock. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that hard way on one stock. <laughs> and, um, and I started, you know, averaging down and, you know, it would, it's going to come back. And then I think I averaged down maybe two times. And I said, after that, I'm done. And it just continued to go down, go down, and I said, that's it. I said, you know, I learned. And that was a penny stock. So, so, <laughs> so you know, I, I wish I could say, wow, John, that's a special, special story. But it's really not that special because I, I'm pretty sure we've all had some sort of experience like that. So, uh, you know, it, it happens to everybody, but it's how you react that's going to. And let, let me and be honest here. Who did you blame about all that? Did you blame somebody else or did you look in the mirror and say john what were you doing who, who did you blame at that point uh really i blame myself and the other people okay because, <laughs> um, honest answer i like that yeah because i mean the two people that i were that i was talking to the other two traders i thought knew what they were doing <laughs> and then you know it came to me and said john you know open your eyes you can't believe everything you hear um, and I just, I just put it aside and I said, it's time to move on. You know, I'm, you learn, you learn as long as you can learn from your, your mistakes and try not to create them again. That's how I look at life. Nice. That's uh that, that's fantastic. And, you know, so at this point in time, uh, you know, you're, you're trading, you know, those bottom plays you're holding. And I know more recently, uh, you've gotten, uh, more interested in options is that that's correct right that is correct yes and, uh, and what first let me ask what what sparked your interest in you know tra transitioning because i know you've been very i mean you're whenever i see you in the chat room I'm like okay that's probably some sort of bottom play because you're very very good at those uh you know you're almost like the sniper of the room that's always throwing up some nice little bottom plays you just you definitely have a feel for those so knowing that's going well for you what kind of sparked your interest in options and you know kind of take us from there um, well, I tell you, the options really had not come up for maybe about three years ago, and um, and I was in, in a chat room at that time, and they were they were teaching it a little bit, and I just I said I just they're too hard, I just can't learn it, not even the basics. So I just put it aside until about maybe a year ago it just hit me about options and then i started reading a little more on them about you know where can you control one contract of 100 shares for say a hundred dollars and i mean the risk versus the reward i mean it's unbelievable it's better you know than spending five thousand dollars in a trade why not put a couple hundred dollars in a trade and you can possibly make a, a easy 25% return, 30% return or more. It, it's the, the potential for trading options. It, it's unlimited, which you can return and the amount of money that you can lose. It just depends if it's a hundred dollars, that's the most you go lose. You know, then that's the most you can, you can kind of really establish, you know, your worst right. case scenario right in advance, um, which is pretty cool. And uh, something that I really liked, but um, you know something else I want to bring up is Clay. Clay, you would probably agree with this that you had actually w didn't get interested in options until you know uh, G you know Gator and a couple other people in the chat room had had convinced you that it's not as difficult you know as some people make it out to be. And and I completely agree with you, John. When I first started learning about options, they just you know they make it too. They don't ease you into it easy enough they just no. kind of start throwing complex stuff at you and you're just like i can't do all these spreads and things like that it's it's a lot to comprehend so clay clay didn't didn't you have kind of the same experience yeah i know for for years i i mean I, I i did the same thing as john i you know i'd search like what the, uh, intrinsic value entrix you know extrinsic value imply what what is this stuff and i just for years just i i don't understand i don't understand and then um 
Gator got me definitely, uh, you know, he said, you know, you, you're, you're stupid, but you're not that stupid, Clay. So I'm sure you could learn advanced option stuff. But original options, uh, DDM, somebody from the chat room um, who haven't been around for a while, but said, hey, you know, you, you trust me, Clay, you got the hardest part down. You have you already understand charts. So you need to learn just like 10 percent more and then you could trade options. I, I, and I was thinking, really? I thought I thought I had to learn like 90 percent of stuff and it was only 10 percent charts. And no, no, that you. You know, the big thing with options is you got to figure, you got to know what direction do you think the price is going to go? And you, you already know that because you know charts. I said, like, that's true. I'm pretty confident that I can, you know, forecast what direction I think the price is going to go. So I, I dug in and, oh, okay. And yeah, so I was like, wow, you know, but the, the way people teach it out there, I don't know if these people try to, you know, just want to sound smart. So they try to use fancy terms when they explain stuff. But, uh, you know, for anybody that's taking my courses, I'm just, like I said, I'm not the smartest cookie out there. So my mind only works with like childlike analogies. So when I put together the course, I mean, we're talking about drama queens. We're talking about black mold. We're talking about, about Mona Lisa. I don't know what else we're talking. We're talking about all sorts of goofy little things, but uh, apparently, uh, you know, black mold and Mona Lisa and uh, all that sort of stuff, you know, resonate with people. Yeah, I think a reason for that, the you know, some people presenting in a very complex manner is because a lot of people will just take, you know, what might be taught in a a college level, you know, finance options course, and they're teaching you about the Black Shoals models, and there's oh, all brother. these symbols, and you know, Greeks, and all this stuff, and you know, it doesn't, you know, and what we all come to find out, and you know, as Clay shows in this course, is it really doesn't have to be that complicated. And I just think that some people, you know, unfortunately, that's just how they learned it. And they think that that's the way it kind of needs to be presented. And it, it it really doesn't need to be that complicated. Would you Would you agree with that, John? I agree 100 uh, percent. Clay is a great teacher. He, he's dying to earth where, I mean, everybody should be able to understand how he teaches. There's no problem w with his teachings. I mean, who doesn't love learning about Pac-Man and, you know, mold and blowfish all on, you know, a, a Saturday morning? So that's, you know, right. it's, it's a different twist on it for sure. Right, let me, I'll put it this way to listeners. If you know that Mona Lisa the Mona Lisa painting, if you know that that is a good thing, if you own that piece of uh, art and you know that black mold is a bad thing, then, hey, you can trade options, okay? And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. Um, so we're, we're getting way off topic here. So, John, you're, uh, you know, how is your trading actually going right now? What are you trading? Uh, do you have any sort of favorite strategies out there outside of, you know, we know you like the bottom plays, but, you know, what's kind of, uh, give us an update on your current situation. Okay, uh, like you brought up right now, I'm still trading some options. Um, uh, basically, uh, I trade Apple. That's what I've been going with. That's the main one. Uh, I've done pretty good with Apple. Um, and I'm starting to get back into the swing uh, trading just as far as some uh, stocks because of my work where I do have a day job and everything. Um, I just feel as far as the options, uh, the basic options, it's hard for me to um, keep an eye on them where they go back, uh, fluctuate so fast, the volatility. Uh, at the present time, I just can't monitor them at work so much. Uh, so I've decided to go back to some swing trading uh, stocks. But as far as the bottom plays, yes, uh, I will continue to stay with those. And right now, I'm concentrating on doing uh, some of what I would call a um, uptrend, the continuation patterns once they break out up like the second leg and everything, uh, and trying to get in uh, as long as they stay above the 20 day moving average. I'm trying to learn and use my stops right below the 20 day moving average uh, for its uptrends. So basically what I'm doing now is focusing on and learning more about the uptrends than the bottom plays. You kind of want to, you know, you, you want to ride those winners as long as you can. And I think exactly. I, I, I'm the same way as far as trend trading. I love to use a moving average just to, you know, tell me, are we still moving up or, you know, are we going to start to go sideways and it's time to take profit. So I love, I love that. And, um, and uh, so, so now I know you've been trading for you know quite a long time, many, many, many years. You know how you know. Let me let the viewers know and listeners know how does how did taking a loss back then kind of you know make you feel inside versus you know how does how does taking a loss now kind of you know what what emotions does that invoke? Uh, sometimes back then it's like 
I want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it was a big loss. I know but, the, I know the feeling. But uh, now it's, you know, I, I've learned a lot. And for any trader or who wants to be a trader, if you go uh, be trading in the market, you it, you know, you go lose, and you better you better learn that from the beginning because it's gonna happen. But you just have to minimize your losses and let the the big winners uh, move on. You know, in the uptrend and, and gain what you can by moving your stop losses up. But uh, I'm just you know, it's it's a learning experience still. And uh, far as how I feel, I just say, hey. It happened. I'm going to move on to the next one because you can't let your, as Clay teaches, if you start getting your emotions involved, you're in trouble. So I try to stay. I said, it's another day. It's another trade. I've learned. I'm going to move on. I'm, the next trade is going to be a better trade. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I love, if you let your emotions in, get involved, you're going to get in trouble. And uh, that's funny you, you mentioned that because I was just watching a, a, a BBC documentary on trading. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, a, a trader was, you know, he he had gone and I think he made like 120,000 in a, a few minutes, and that was his biggest trade ever. And then he was talking about how, you know, because of that, he was allowed to start to risk more. Um, and you know, it's amazing how in the professional trading world, everything they keep talking about risk. That that's odd to me. It, right. They never talk about huge winners. It's always risk. So, anyways, he was allowed to risk more, and he got himself in a bad trade. And then he tried the same thing again. He lost more money. And then he started to think, you know, his motions were involved. You know, I'm, I'm frustrated. I got, I want to get this money back. He made another trade um, and the, uh, he, he lost more money. And then he said at that point in time, the, the department risk manager, whatever risk. So think about it. These professional trading floors have a risk manager, a risk management partner. You said the risk manager came over, turned off his computer and he, he called, you know, he had to take the walk of shame into the office. And the guy looked at him and said, you know, you know, I couldn't be more disappointed in you. Now get out. So just like that, I mean, emotions, uh, like you said, if you let those get involved, uh, you know, they're, they're going to destroy you. And uh, and obviously that's what that risk manager noticed. He said, wow, this guy want, had a couple big wins. Uh, we let him increase his risk. And then all of a sudden he let the risk get totally out of control. And uh, yeah, he lost his job right then and there. Um, but yeah, fantastic point. So if we start to wrap things up, uh, especially for someone like you, I, I think this would be a fascinating question. What would you say are some of your strengths right now? And what do you say? What do you think are probably some of your weaknesses, some things that you still want to work on? Uh, I think as far as my strengths is right now that I'm a lot more educated than I was and uh, more disciplined. And I want, um, as far as my weaknesses, um, I think when I, as far as my weaknesses, I, I think I need to work a little more on letting my winners run a little more. I, I still have that little conservative. Uh, I'm still conservative that once I hit like a certain dollar amount, I'm just going to go ahead and sell it. And I, I, you know, I've made a profit and, and there's times that I know that the winners go keep running, but uh, I want to work on letting the winners uh, run a little more. Yeah, that's always a good thing, you know, to, to and it's difficult for, for anybody who's a, who hasn't traded out there. You know, it's just not natural for you to see, you know, you, you're up a, a healthy percent um, or, you know, you have a nice dollar gain in your account. You just naturally want to take it. But at the same time, you know, you, you, you do yourself a disservice if, you know, that could run another 25 percent, 50 percent. So it's all about kind of trailing those stuff. And, you know, that's totally you know, something I think everybody works on, you know, even including Clay. Clay has some live videos he does where uh, oh, yeah. he actually has, it has to work I don't know if that. you ever master that, to be honest. I don't know if you can ever totally master that. You can get close, but, yeah, I, that's, I totally relate, and I'm always working on that. Let your yeah. runners run because there's nothing worse than saying, I mean, who's been there? For you listeners out there, think to yourself, have you ever been in the situation where you say, oh, if I wouldn't have sold, I'd be up, and then fill in the blank. I mean, exactly. And, and you know, we, we've all been there, that, and yeah. I think everybody probably struggles with that. So, uh, so John, now what if if you if I was able to kind of lend you my time machine, you know, for only a couple shares of a penny stock of your choice back in the day, um, and you could go back to when you were just starting to trade and give yourself one piece of advice, what do you think that would be? I think it boils down to edu education. I really do. Um, I think you just need to educate yourself more and more, uh, like educate. Once you, uh, you learn it, test it, what you learn, and then ta take action on uh, everything. 
I like that. Learn it, test it, and then take action. That's that's well said. I, I don't a lot of people forget that the whole test it thing. They think just because they've gone through a course that, hey, I'm ready for big money now, and they put a whole way too much money on the line and then learn wait, wait it and go all in. And then yeah, see exactly. What that's yeah. yep. Learn it and go all, all in. Well, let's well, we're gonna talk about have some fun questions now, John. So, you know, these are the serious questions. Okay. So what is your favorite movie? I would say my favorite movie is Weekend at Bernie's. Uh, I, I, uh, I've never seen that one, to be I'm honest. But I'm so happy with you, John, right now. Thank <laughs> you very much. I, breaking I, the streak. Breaking yep, the streak I, don't, I think the streak was like one episode anyway. So it's this whole thing I should have probably never proposed it because I can't even put together <laughs> a, two, a two podcast streak anymore these days. So uh, I, um, I, get, I get enjoyment out of this every single yeah. week lately. <laughs> so we have to leave this segment in it. But um, so what, uh, what would you say is probably your favorite meal, your go to meal? Um, I've always been brought up in this area, um, potatoes, uh, uh, probably chicken and for some type of greens, I try to eat healthy. So. I was going to, I was going to say, it sounds like somebody is, uh, is health conscious and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, that now correct. as far as dessert, do you, do you treat yourself a little bit or do you have like I, kale or broccoli or something? For <laughs> I, I hope you have something a little more fun for dessert. He has a, he has a kale shake. <laughs> no, uh, I, I'm pretty good. I'm disciplined on sweets. I mean, I don't eat a lot, but I do treat myself, but probably my favorite dessert would be, uh, a cheesecake. Nice. You can never go wrong with a cheesecake. What about, uh, you know, if, if you could visit any place someday, where would you like to visit? Oh, wow. Um, let's see. I've done some traveling. Um, well, actually, let's change this up. Okay. Out of the traveling you've done, where's the fa- where's uh, the, the uh, your your favorite location that you've gone to? Probably the Dominican Republic. Very nice. Clay's, Clay's looking for a kind of vacation spot, so uh, that's what we're doing now lately. Is we're asking. Yeah, my uh, wife and I we've been there twice, and uh, along with my uh, brother and sister-in-law, and uh, it's a very nice place. We, we really enjoy it. Awesome, awesome. Now, uh, what do you do, you know, outside of market hours or your job uh, for fun, or you know, just hobbies in general? Hobbies. Uh, well, I, I play the guitar. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, I do play that. Uh, I do play the drums, but mainly it's the guitar. I like helping, and I've po- probably posted, and we've talked about it in the chat room. Uh, I like helping people. I uh, with their finances. I uh, took Dave Ramsey's uh, Financial Peace University course uh, probably about 15 years ago. And uh, I've coordinated some uh, classes, uh, one at work and a few others around at uh, my church and other churches. So I like helping other people with their finances. And, you know, I, I hate I've been there. I've been at the bottom. Uh, I know what it's like. And I uh, said uh, I don't want to go back again. And... Um, and that's through education too. Uh, it educate, is. He educated me, and I'm um, disciplined, and I just like helping other people to you know w- to manage their finances if possible. Let me uh, let me ask you this: um, How important is a, a personal budget? I think it's very uh, very. Is that not like important. the cornerstone? Like, if you want success in life, you should probably it have a, a, pers- a personal budget, right? Exactly, because I mean. It's so easy today, you know, especially young ones, you know, they don't have a budget and, and it's just like trading. It's a management of your account, uh, trading account. I mean, you, you just got to watch it and you just, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, really, it's common sense. You can't have any going night than you have coming in. It, you, you just can't do it. Yeah, but and it's it's, it's I'll I'll just say this because we could have a whole podcast on personal finance. Oh, I know. If you listeners, if you want to get into trading or if you are trading and you don't have a personal budget, what makes you think you're going to have any success long term as a trader? If you can't right. manage your personal business, which is your personal finances, what makes you think you can manage a trading business, which it is? If you want to get serious with all this, what makes you think you can manage that? So, uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, uh, it's just, I don't know. Like I said, I can't, well, I'll just drop it here because this is not a, a personal finance thing, but, uh, yeah. So anyways, I, I, 
John, maybe we'll have to have you back, John, and we can just we'll, talk we'll put about that. As, we'll put this on the rant okay. podcast too. We'll do more on the rant podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which uh, Ches and I had decided we're going to have a, a ranting podcast where we just talk about different things. But so, John, we'll just move into the final question here. And three words. You know, what would you use to describe what you would say describes a successful trader? Uh, I would say education, and after you've been educated, test. Because you want to test what you've learned, and the third one would be action. Just just go on what you've educated and test it. That's that's fantastic. That's uh, if that doesn't summarize the 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 three such a complex process, not complex, but in a pretty in depth process, and you just summarize it in three words. So well done, sir. Well, hey John, uh, you know, thank you again. This was a good time. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Like I said, the context here: Saturday morning, early in the morning. And you were willing to do this. So, you know, thanks a lot for, uh, for hanging out. Okay, thank you. And if you, have, or if you enjoyed today's podcast, I should say, and hopefully you did, uh, you know, a few things. If you're listening to this on claytrader.com, click that share button, you know, uh, just get the word out. And, um, you know, a lot of valuable things were discussed here. And, you know, just share that with uh, friends or whoever. Uh, leave a comment below. Uh, especially I know John, he's, uh, he likes to teach. He's got a heart of a teacher too, as uh, he mentioned with uh, – his uh, just his passion for personal finance stuff. So if you leave any comments or questions for him, you know, on the, uh, you know, on the show notes page, I'm sure he would uh, get to those and be happy to, uh, you know, assist you in any way. Also, if you're listening to this on iTunes, please leave us a rating and comment. Chaz and I read all those, and we uh, we like to hear from people. So uh, those little things uh, really do go a long way for us. So thank you again for hanging out. Get out there, trade without emotion. We will see you back for the next episode. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.